or Genesis chapter 4, mentioned that we'll continue going through our uh, study on Genesis here on Sunday nights until the 19th, just the Sunday before Christmas. We will um, adjust there and, and preach on the birth of Christ. Um, but for tonight, we're going to continue on in the book of Genesis. So Genesis chapter number 4. And uh, we're going to get to the accounts of Cain versus Abel. And so uh, we're going to read verses 1 through verse 8 of Genesis chapter 4. The Bible says, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. I remember when we found out that my son was a boy, and that was how I felt. I've gotten a man child from God. That's what she's saying here. Verse 2, And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth. And his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why out art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And so the title of our message tonight is An Acceptable Gift for an Exceptional God. May God bless you in his word. You may be seated. <clears throat> well, those in an exceptional place are worthy of an, ex an acceptable reward. We believe that kind of a rewards honor system here in the United States of America. You might think of when an employee uh, does very well and exceeds expectations and goes exceptionally above everybody else. They might be awarded with an employee of the month award. You might think of a manager that goes exceptionally beyond the budgeted sales. And so they might receive a bonus or some kind of recognition. I know the company that I worked for was notorious for that. They gave out a lot of bonuses. They always had a big national sales meeting every year and they would give out plaques and awards to those who exceeded expectations. When a high schooler gets exceptional grades, they end up with an, on being on the honor roll. Or if a college graduate gets exceptional grades, you know, they get to graduate with that summa cum laude whatever that means, <laughs> but it means they're exceptional. And so they get that sash and they get a, a, a specific type of, a, of the hood wear that goes on their gown. And so we, we've got that reward system. And then, of course, when we think of the sports world, that when an athlete uh, uh, rises above all the rest of his peers, that they'll receive accolades, they'll receive recognition, award ceremonies at the end of the year, like the Heisman Trophy or the uh, Maxwell Trophy or the Doak Walker Award for the best running back. They'll get those things. Or they have uh, coaching awards as well for those who rise to the top and just exceed expectations. They do an exceptional job, and so they get rewarded. Sometimes they get rewarded with a very lucrative contract in the sports world in particular. And so I say all that just to say we, we realize and we, we pretty well accept the fact that those who stand out above others as exceptional are worthy of an acceptable reward. Well, I believe you'd agree with me that we really do serve an exceptional God. I mean, he's a God that, ra that rises to the top. He's above all. He's transcendent above all men, above all principalities and powers. He rises above all kings, above all gods, and above all creation. He's exceptional. He's referred to in the scripture as the ancient of days, as the most high God, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He reigns supreme above all demonic forces and, and all those powers and authorities. He is the one true and living God. He created an exceptional world 
full of exceptional plants and exceptional trees, exceptional animals, and an exceptional species of man. Exceptional. In fact, every time he made something, and by the end of the creation, remember what he said? And it was very good. What was God saying? Exceptional. Well, on top of all of that, when we sinned, he loved us so much that he gave the most exceptional gift of all. When our Savior Jesus Christ came and suffered the death of the crucifixion on our behalf to pay the ransom price for our sins so we could be forgiven, we could be reconciled to God, to a whole new relationship with him, and of course have eternal life in heaven. That, my friends, is an exceptional gift. Adam and Eve raised their children, Cain and Abel, to understand the fact that God is an exceptional God who is worthy of an acceptable gift. On an appointed day, we're told these two boys brought an offering to the Lord, and really this offering was to show how much they valued and appreciated God. And so what we find in our account here is there are two boys who had two different jobs, brought two different offerings, but only one was accepted. And the question that often comes to our mind is, why? Why did God accept Abel's offering over Cain's offering? Because when we come to offer our worship to God, I believe that we need to understand that he is an exceptional God and he is worthy of an acceptable gift in worship to him. Whether we're talking about our, our church attendance or if we're talking about our singing and the way that we sing, how loud we sing, with what heart we sing, or with what heart we serve him, he's worthy that it should be exceptional as well. Well, how do we offer an acceptable gift to God? I mean, what does it even look like for us to be able to come before God with a gift that he would look at and just say, acceptable, pleasing, pleasing? I respect this offering. And so we need to figure out why Abel's offering was accepted versus Cain's. And so we have these two boys. They bring their offering before the Lord. Verse 1 tells us that Adam knew Eve, his wife, marital relationship there that results in conception. It says that she conceived and bare Cain. And she said this, I have gotten a man from the Lord. You know what the word Cain means? Basically this gotten. <laughs> it means to acquire. It means to get. And so what she's saying here is as she gives birth to this child, she's saying, I have gotten a man from the Lord. There's great joy, great rejoicing there as you would expect with the birth of a child. But it was a little different for her because in the previous chapter, she had been promised that from her would come forth a seed who would be the savior of mankind, who would bruise the head of the serpent. And she was looking forward to this seed that would come forth. And so when Cable or when Cain, wow, when Cain is born, that's one way to put it, I guess. When Cain was born, here's what she said. This is him. This is the one. This is the seed that's been promised. I have gotten him a man from the Lord. Well, evidently as Cain grew, she began to see things in his life that said, no, this isn't the Savior. This boy is worse of a sinner than I am, even as he was a child and as he's growing up. But she's just looking at him and saying, saying this isn't it. Uh, I'm, an, I'm a diehard Oklahoma State Cowboys fan. It was very disappointing that we lost the Big 12 championship yesterday. But anyhow, we have a, uh, a defensive coordinator by the name of Jim Knowles, and he's kind of a roughneck, old-school guy, really rowdy, yells at people, all those things. Well, he's also kind of a quirky guy, and so sometimes he'll go to practice, and he won't, he'll tell everybody, I'm not yelling at you today. He would have a coffee cup, and on this plain white coffee cup would be black lettering that says, that ain't it, bro. That's a good Southern term for you there. That ain't it, bro. And so what he would do is as he's watching drills, as these guys come, and anytime he saw less than exceptional effort, anytime he saw it falling short of what he expected of them, all he would do is he'd take a sip of that coffee cup and he'd point it at him and say, that ain't it, bro. <laughs> well, that's kind of what is going on here. 
And here's the reason why I say that, because then if you go to verse 2, it says, and she bare again his brother Abel. You know what Abel means? Breath. Okay, well, that sounds weird. Well, it got really cold this afternoon really quick. I didn't know if you noticed that or not. I went outside and, you know, expected to be nice and everything. And I was just wearing, I wasn't wearing a jacket or anything, just my, my shirt here. And uh, I was like, oh, it's cold. And when I got out of the garage, I breathed and I saw my breath come out and it was there and it was gone. That's the idea of the word able, that it's, a, it's like a vapor that's there for just a split second and then it's gone. Why would she name her son that? Well, I believe it's because she looked at Cain's life and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And then she came to the point where she said, that ain't it, bro. <laughs> and so she said, that was short lived. That was there and gone. That wasn't the seed. And so she names her son Abel. So you have these two boys who are growing, probably young men by this point in time. And these two young men had two different jobs. Verse 2 says that Abel was a keeper of the sheep. He was a shepherd. But it says that Cain was a tiller of the ground. Major contrast there. It doesn't say and Cain was a tiller of the ground. It says but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And so just a big contrast there. So you've got this young man over here that he is keeping sheep all day long. He's with those sheep, loves those sheep. And then you've got this farmer boy over here that's working the ground hard. Now, let me clear up a spot and say this. There's nothing wrong with either of the jobs these two men took on. If we go back to the creation account, what did God command Adam and Eve to do? To have dominion over every uh, cattle and the fowl of the air and the, the, the fish of the sea, they were to have dominion over all the animals and they were also commanded to till the ground. And so there's nothing wrong with either of these two jobs. It's just what they did, what they took on. Well, these two men then bring two offerings of the Lord that were according to their occupations. Verse three says, and in the process of time and that that phrase there, it literally means this, at the end of the days or when the days were accomplished or at a specific established point in time. Now, what is this point in time? We're, we don't know. We're not given much of an explanation here other than to say this, that evidently their family had developed a pattern of worshiping God, that there was a certain time of the year or a certain amount of days or a certain day in specific when they said, we're going to bring offerings to God for what he's blessed us with. And so it says that at this point in time, what happens is Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And then verse 4 says, and Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And so you have these two men that bring these two different offerings. And Cain, of course, of the fruit of the ground and then Abel, of course, of the flock of sheep. What I want to just simply point out to us is this, that while they were workers, they were also worshipers. That even though they were working in their own field, working in their own occupation, they still took time to worship God. And so I just want to say this, that people with a job ought to worship God. That's what we ought to do. Uh, when God blesses you with a good job and with money to be able to make a living and have a house and have a car and get around and even to have some food and some coffee and some nice things in life, when God chooses to bless you that way, what that ought to do is ought to create within us a gratefulness, a thankfulness that says, boy, look at everything that God's blessed me with. And it ought to create such a grateful heart within us that we would be willing to give back to him in worship. That's what's going on here. God expects us to give according to the means with which he blesses us. That's why God didn't set a specific amount. What did he say? A percentage the tenth, the, the tithe. And so, well, what's so good about that? Well, because it means this, that if you don't make next to nothing, <laughs> you don't have to give what a millionaire would give, right? It levels the playing field. Why? Because God is fair. God is just. And so he's not going to purposefully oppress somebody. And so those who make little give in accordance with what they are given. And those who make much give in accordance with what they are given by God. And that's just what God expects of us. And here's really the reason why. Because workers who aren't worshipers end up 
idolaters. What do you mean by that? Because think of what would happen if we never take the time to recognize everything God has blessed us with. Could you imagine what that would do? It would turn us into something maybe like this. Look at this job I got for myself. Look at, look at this money that I went out and I worked hard for. And look at all the stuff that I bought for myself with my hard-earned dollars. You know what that sounds a little bit like? Self-worship. <laughs> Look at my strength. No, I went to the gym and I worked out and I did all those things to be able to get this intensive labor job. Or I went to college and I went and got my education so I could afford this type of, of job and qualify for that. And so we can get, get to the point where if we don't take the time to reflect and worship and, and, and bless God for the way that he's blessed us, then what we end up doing is we end up worshiping something else. Whether we're talking about worshiping ourselves or we can talk about how folks might worship their sports team. And so they, they get their season tickets and they go to all the games and they spend $50 on a bowl of popcorn and, and then all of that stuff. Or they might spend all their money on, on uh, recreation. And so they go and they take these extravagant vacations or they go to every theme park in the world. I'm not against theme parks. I've been to several of them and I enjoy that and I enjoy vacations. But what I'm simply saying is this. That if we don't take the time to acknowledge that our blessings come from God, we will soon forget him and begin to worship everything else in life. That's what happens. So these were workers who were also worshipers. They both, Cain and Abel, took a portion of what God had given them and they gave it back to him. But evidently there was a problem with Cain's offering. Because verse Five, or the end of verse 4 says this, And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. That word respect there, it means literally to gaze upon. The idea is this, God couldn't take his eyes off of it. He was saying, that's good. That's, that's right. That is acceptable. That's what it's talking about. He had respect unto Abel and unto his offering, but it says, in verse 5, but unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. The same word there. He didn't even look at it. He didn't take a second glance at it. That means that God wasn't satisfied, that it wasn't acceptable in his sight. And so the deepest question that comes to our minds in this account is really, why did God respect Abel's but not Cain's? Well, some suggest that it was because Cain's offering was of the fruit of the ground and that it was uh, representative of Cain's uh, righteous works and that Abel's was a blood sacrifice which represents the atonement for sin. And so there are some who take that position and, and the reality is I'm not going to argue with them because that is a true position, that is a biblical position, that, that all the righteousness that we could do is still nothing better than filthy rags according to the scripture and we need a blood atoning sacrifice and that sacrifice was Jesus Christ. And so I'm not going to fuss, I'm not going to argue with people about that. But there are a couple of problems. That is a biblical truth but I don't think it can fit into this particular context. The reason why is because, for one, the word offering as it's given here is not a word that speaks of a sin offering or a burnt offering. The Hebrew language has different words for each of those Levitical offerings that would be offered. This particular word is the word minha, which is a word that was a gift or an offering and an expression of gratitude, thanksgiving, and worship. It wasn't commanded by God. It was just what people, what people brought. And so th there's that side of it that it wasn't a sin offering. And so that makes it to where the blood can't necessarily be the problem here, or the lack of blood in Cain's instance. And then another problem with that interpretation of this passage is that according to the law, both in Leviticus and in Deuteronomy, while the offerings of the herd and the offerings of the flock were certainly accepted, you also find that meal offerings were accepted by God. They were grain offerings. They were offerings of the fruit of the ground. And so what, what we find here is that whether it was of the flock or if it was of the fruit of the ground, but the material portion of the offerings was acceptable by God in God's eyes. 
And so it can't be with the specific material of the offering. And so what we need to do is rather than looking at this, and it's really hard to, it's hard to go through the scriptures now that we know who Jesus is and what he's done. It's hard for us to go through the scriptures and view them through the veiled eyes of the Jews. But that's really what we need to do here is we've got to remember, and this is referring back to our very first message here, that the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy was the Pentateuch. It was the books of the law written to the Israelites who were entering into the promised land in Joshua's time, the ones who were settling the land. And so that's why this was written. So we need to understand from their mindset, what would the problem have been here? Well, I want to show you what that is. They would not have recognized error with the material offering because they knew according to Leviticus and Deuteronomy, which they had as a people, they would have recognized that, that both a sheep and a grain offering would have been acceptable to God. And so that's not what would have sparked their concern. What, would ha- what they would have recognized as error is this, that in verse 3 it says, that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord... But I want you to notice what verse 4 says. And Abel, he also brought, watch this, of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. The fat's the good part. (laughs) Now, I'm not a big fat eater when it comes to steak, but Hannah is. I get a ribeye. She wants to eat the the fatty portions off the ribeye. That's just not my cup of tea. But that fat is what infuses all the juice and the flavoring and the taste into that steak. That's the good part, but that's not necessarily what this is talking about. What it's talking about is the biggest, the fattest of the firstborn. Now, here's what the Israelites would have recognized to be error. Abel's offering, it was of the firstlings. It was the fattest of them. Cain's offering was not the first fruits of the ground It was just the fruit of the ground. See, they would have recognized great error with that because they knew that when they bring an offering like this to God, it was to be of the first fruits, the most ripe, the most beautiful, the perfect, the pristine, the most tasty, the juiciest, the absolute best is what they were supposed to bring to God. And so as they look at this situation going on, immediately they're going to see, well, Cain only brought of the fruit of the ground. But Abel brought of the firstling of the fattest of the flock. And so that's what they would have seen. See, really the problem lies here in the attitude of Cain's heart as to what the Lord was worthy of. That was the problem. And so what we see here is that God accepted Abel but rejected Cain because Abel offered the best, but Cain only offered the rest. That was the problem here. Abel went through the absolute best he had of his flock while Cain just kind of gave God the leftovers, gave him what was, what was the rest of it. A man by the name of Kenneth Matthews said this, that God's response toward Cain and Abel was not due to the nature of the gift, but to the integrity of the giver. Notice that it says this at the end of verse 4, And the Lord had respect unto Abel, and to his offering. But verse 5 says, but unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. See, what that tells us is that God cares not just about the condition of the offering, but he cares about the condition of the person who is bringing the offering to him. See, the problem is really this, that Cain had a very low view of God. That was his problem. If you consider what happened here, Abel started by sorting through his flock and he, he had perhaps taken great care at the very beginning and he had already marked through, okay, this was a firstborn, this was a firstborn, this was a firstborn. And so he tagged all the firstborn and so he aligns all the firstborn, lines them up and then he says, okay, which is the fattest of the firstborn? And when he finds it, he says, that is what God is worthy of. And so there's a very careful selection process. He went through great lengths. He worked very hard to make sure he was only bringing God the best. But what happened with Cain? 
Well, Cain goes out and he's just kind of like gathering up without thinking about it. He's just taking whatever he can instead of going through and being like, no, God's not worthy of that. God's worthy of this one. No, that one's no good. This one, that's perfect. This, this harvest of grain here, it's kind of skinny. I, I can't bring that before God. But this kind over here, that's full of wheat. I can bring that before God. You see the difference there? That while Abel ensured that God was getting his absolute best, Cain was just giving God what was left. Here's really what was going on. Abel was saying, God is worthy of all this. While Cain was saying, this is all God's worthy of. You notice the difference there? Yeah, big difference. Abel gave God the best, but Cain gave God the rest. Therefore, Abel was accepted, but Cain was rejected. Listen, I want to just say this to us tonight, that God doesn't just care that we worship he cares about the heart with which we worship. See, when, when you keep the best and just give the rest, what it reveals in our heart is that we have a low view of God. That we can look at God in, in our approach to coming to church, in our approach to prayer, our approach to Bible reading. We can come, we can come in those situations and just be kind of scatterbrained and we can come and sit in church and instead of singing out and giving him the praise that he's worthy of, we can just kind of sit there and him haw through it and maybe, maybe mouth some words and not really give it our best. We're just kind of giving God what we have left. And we've gone through a whole work week and Sunday is maybe my one day off. And so I, but on Sunday I'm coming to church and you can just kind of get to the point where you say this, at least I'm here, God. <laughs> at least the fruit's here. It may not be the first thing. It may not be the fat thereof, but at least I've got the fruit here. What that shows is that we don't think that God is worthy of our best. It shows that maybe what that we think what we want is more important than what God deserves. That was the sinful heart of Cain. I mean, and the sinfulness of Cain comes out in his ensuing response to his rejection. Look what it says in verse 5. It says, and Cain was very wroth. Nothing sounds good about that. Not broth, wroth. <laughs> That means, uh, the word wrath, it literally means like a burning heat. That there was a flame of anger inside of him. That he was furious that God would accept his brother Abel and reject what I had to bring. I, I worked hard. I went out there and I gathered all this stuff. And maybe my offering was even bigger than his. And my offering was more beautiful than his. In Cain's eyes, that's how he viewed it. He was wroth. He was furious. And it says this, and his countenance fell. The literal translation of that would be the face fell. I mean, you ever seen a kid? They can be one second up and jumping and hopping and skipping and they're all excited and then you tell them no and what do they do? Mm. That's the idea of the countenance falling. But combine that with wrath. I don't think it was just a, I can't believe God didn't accept my offering. No, it was more like this. Instead of his face being lifted up, his face had fallen. He had become angry, wroth, furious with God. And so God confronts Cain with the dangerous nature of his sin. In verse number six, the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, if you're doing good, if you're doing the right thing, he says, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. You know what he's saying there? Sin is creeping around at your doorstep. When you don't do well, sin is right there and it's ready to strike in your life. And, and he says this, here's really what God is doing. I mean, this is really grace because he's coming to him and he's saying, if you do well, you'll be accepted. You know what God's implying there? If you'll do the right thing, what you did before, yeah, that was insufficient. But there's still a way to turn this thing around. There's still a way to get back in a right place with me. And now that he sinned, that would be going and, and purchase, go and purchase a lamb from your brother and make sure it's a firstling and make sure it's the fattest and bring that to me and offer up the atonement for your sin and things can be made right at this point. If thou doest well, 
thou mayest be accepted. He's saying we can turn this back around, but if you don't do well, sin lieth at the door. And it says, and unto thee shall be his desire. Sin will want to rule over you. Think of, again, going back to Adam and Eve's relationship and how her desire would be unto him. It would be to, to rule over him, to rise up against him. That's what he's saying is that sin wants to rise up against you, but you will rule over your sin if you'll get things right. But if you don't deal with your sin, if you don't rule your sin, your sin will rule you. That's what he's telling him. Well, let's look at Cain's response. There's not one. He gave God the silent treatment. See, because what happens is when we get confronted with our sin, can I just say this is a message that can have the potential to rub us raw. Can I say it rubbed me raw a little bit in, in the office because I realize this, that there's far too many times in my life when I come to God in prayer and maybe I just pray for just a couple minutes and I rush into the prayer and I ask God, give me this, give me that, give me this and that and everything else that I need. But I don't take time to worship him and I realize, boy, I've just given him the rest. I haven't given him the best. I haven't given him what's worthy. I haven't given him the best time of my day. Maybe there are times you don't give him the best offering that you could give. You don't give what's required and you just give kind of the rest. And, and so I'm just saying that there can be a potential here for a message like this to really rub us raw. And in those situations, if we're not careful, we can respond like Cain, that when God confronts us with our sin, here's what he's trying to do. He's trying to make amends. He's trying to turn our heart back to him. He's trying to get things back in the right perspective. But we're, if we're not careful, we can become wroth. We can allow our countenance to fall. We can become bitter and angry with God to the point where we're just silent. Don't even respond to him. Well, then Cain's sinful anger led him to do the unthinkable. Verse 8 and Cain talked with Abel, his brother. I wonder what they talked about. Well, I don't know, but I imagine maybe Cain came to Abel and said, huh, so you think you're better than me because God accepted your offering. And I'm sure Abel came back and said, no, I don't think I'm better than you at all. I just simply gave God everything that I could, and that's what he requires. He just asked us to give him our best, and maybe Cain fought back with him and said, but I tried hard, and he still didn't accept me, and now you're trying to rule over me is what he's thinking. Well, things go south. It says, and it came to pass while they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him unimaginable that a brother would be so angry with God and with his brother that he would kill him over an offering unto the Lord. You see, what goes on in the heart will show up in the field. The sin in, in your heart can lead you to do foolish things. Things. It can lead you to be angry at God. It can lead you to be envious of others because of what they have. Or it can lead you to take your frustrations out on your own family and your children, your spouse. Uh, sin in your heart will lead you to half-hearted worship in the way that you give, in the way you serve, in the way that you sing, and how often you attend church, how often you read your Bible personally, how often you spend time in prayer and worship to God. Sin in our heart will affect us when we're out in the field. And here's the problem. If you don't conquer the sin in your heart, sin will conquer your life. It'll lead you to do things you never imagined were possible. It can lead you to a divorce. It can lead you to quitting church. It can lead you to running away from your family. It can lead you to turn your back on God. It can lead you into drinking. And it can lead you into gambling and smoking and drugs and wasting your life away. See, when sin rules your life, you never know just how far you will go. Your worship cannot be accepted by God until we deal with the sin in the heart. 
Well, what kind of worship is acceptable to God? I think it's very plain to see from our text here that God accepts the worship of those who give their best instead of the rest. That's the kind that God accepts. You know, even in the corporate worship of the church, it's possible to find yourself just sort of giving the rest. That it might be that you wake up on a Sunday morning and things have been tough at home and you, maybe your alarm didn't go off or maybe you didn't set your alarm or, or maybe something just went south. The power went out with phones. Now it's kind of hard to blame it on the home alone syndrome where, you, you know, you unplug the clock, plug it back in, and then it goes to blinking 12s and your alarm doesn't go off on time. It's kind of hard to blame it on that. But let's just leave it, leave it at this, that there are times when you, you wake up on Sunday morning and, and things are kind of a rush and you got up a little bit late and so you're, you're hurrying about and, and you're just in time to get dressed and get in the car and head to church and you're speeding and you're thinking, oh, I got to get there on time. And, and so you're rushing and you're trying to get there and so you get there just in time and you're like, Phew, that was close. I was almost late. I almost didn't make it there. Or it can be that there are times when you might come in uh, halfway through the service or halfway through the first song or something like that. And, and, and so we can, we can get to that point where that happens and you find your way to your chair and you say, well, at least I'm here. At least I'm here. At least I brought the fruit, God. But can I just say this? God is worthy that on a Sunday morning or maybe a Sunday afternoon or maybe a, a Thursday afternoon that maybe we would take some time to settle in before him and to look to his word on a personal level and to worship him. To give of our time to read the word of God. To make sure that our hearts are prepared. That the kids are, are ready on time so we're not rushing and trying to get the kids together. So we can make sure that when we come to the house of God. I mean, can I, and, and understand this. I'm preaching to myself. I've already preached this to myself this week. And I realize I need this again today after this morning with our live stream going haywire and basically up to the wire right before church just trying to figure things out it's hard to be ready to worship God when life's been crazy going into it it really can be but God is worthy that we would come and fellowship and encourage with one another God is worthy that we would be in our place with our hearts ready and prepared to sing praise unto him and to bow before him and worship but listen, we can find ourselves sitting in every single service, but be offering the fruit instead of the firstling with the fat thereof. Now, I want to balance this by saying I recognize that some people come to church, especially when we consider a midweek service. Uh, a lot of people come to church straight from work. And life's been crazy, and there are some people who work overnights, and there are some people who work extended long days. I mean, our, our work schedules can just be absolutely crazy. There can also be times when the car might break down. There might be times when a kid messes their clothes and goes and rolls around in the dirt or has a diaper leak or something like that. I mean, there are times when the kids, the kids will do that. There are. There are times when... Really, we're just doing the absolute best that we can. And you know what God says that to the, to the hard worker who's trying to skirt, skirt by and just barely make it. And you know what? They're still giving their tithe and they may even give to missions and they invite people to come and they work two full time jobs. I mean, some people have to do that. They got to, especially in Boulder, <laughs> they got to work 80 hours a week just to be able to, to rent a 900 square foot apartment here and afford the HOA cost. And so people have to work really hard and, and they, they're doing the absolute best they can and they come into church and yeah, it's been hectic and it's been crazy, but they come and they're singing to the best of their ability and they're getting here as soon as they possibly can and they're giving everything they possibly can and that God would require of them. You know what God says to those who are doing the absolute best they can? Accepted. Acceptable. He looks at that person and he says, I have great respect toward what you bring to me in worship. But I believe it's true that every one of us, from the pastor to the children, need to wrestle with the question, am I worshiping God the absolute best or am I just giving him the rest?
We need to wrestle with that. In your personal worship of giving, it's possible to just give the leftovers. We can sit down and you can set up your budget. You're looking through it and you're saying, okay, I got my mortgage payment, got my car payment, got my utilities, my TV bill, my phone bill. Um, I've got uh, the, the Christmas gifts are on the budget here. And so we're going through, we're budgeting everything. We get down to the end and we say, okay, well, this is all I have left. So I guess I'll give this much to God and I'll put this much in savings. <laughs> Isn't that kind of how we have the tendency to go about our budget? You know what this is showing us? You know what God's worthy of? That when we go and we do our budget that we would say, okay, so God wants me to give a tenth even before Uncle Sam gets into it. Uncle Sam shouldn't be stealing from God, right? And so even before Uncle Sam gets to it, okay, God requires the tenth. But you know what? He put in my heart to give this much to go to missions so that we can send missionaries. Because people really need to hear the gospel. And uh, we're going to be going to a church planting conference in January. So here in a couple weeks, I'm going to promote that we're just going to have a one-time free will offering for people who want to give to ministries just like this. This church received money from that church planting conference, and now we're just looking to pay it back. And so maybe over the course of time, God will speak to your heart about, okay, so I'm supposed to give my tithe. I want to give this much to missions. God spoke to my heart about giving this to church planning conference. Okay, so here's everything I have left. God's, I've given my absolute first and my absolute best to God. Now here's the rest. Let's see how I can squeeze my life into it. That's a tough way to live sometimes. It can be, absolutely. But you know what that demonstrates? A very high view of an exceptional God who is worthy of an acceptable gift. He is absolutely worthy. Why is he worthy? Well, if we really think about it, God gave us his best. See, when we desperately needed our sins to be forgiven, when we, when we needed to be redeemed, when sin had severed our relationship with God and we needed to be reconciled to him, God didn't send an angel. He didn't send an animal. He didn't send a mere mortal man. No, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He gave us his absolute best for our salvation. And when he gave us his very best, how could we just give him the rest? Because he is an exceptional God, he's worthy of an acceptable gift. And that means that everything we offer up to God in worship whether we're talking about our giving, if we're talking about our church attendance, our prayer time, our Bible reading time, if we're talking about when we're at work and we're given, I, I mean, the Bible talks about how we're to uh, serve our masters, that would be our bosses, as unto the Lord. You know what that means? That your work is worship to God. It means that in my home, as a husband and as a father, I'm supposed to love my wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And, and I'm supposed to love my children and bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You know what that is? Worship. You know what God wants me to do at home? Does he want me to just give him the rest? Does he want me to go and, I mean, even we're talking about ministry. Does he want, want me to pour my absolute life into the study and into the ministry? And then when it comes to my relationship with my family, just kind of give him what's left over? No. He wants me to give him my best, but he also wants me to give them my best. Why? Because they're both in worship to God. And so whether we're talking about at home, if we're talking about in marriage, if we're talking about at work, if we're talking about serving him in the ministry of Boulder Valley Baptist Church, he is worthy of of our absolute best. Why? Because he's an exceptional God and being an exceptional God, he deserves an acceptable gift and he accepts the gift of those who give their best instead of the rest. So I just ask in conclusion here, are you giving him your best in every area of life? When you come before God, does he get your best 
or does he get the rest? Let's stand. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight and want to give you our best in what we give, in how we sing, in how we serve, and in every area of our life. You are worthy of the best because you gave us your best. And so I pray that you would just help us, dear Lord, to give you everything we've got. Whether the best we absolutely have is just getting here just in time and going through that hustle and bustle and rush, or it may be that there's some of us that need to pause, reflect, and take some time to see maybe we've just been giving him the rest. You're so much more worthy of that. Help us to look at you like Abel and say, God is worthy of all this. In Jesus' name.